It's like Galbraith said, if you are faced with the task of changing your mind or searching for some sort of a proof that you were correct all the time, most people, they get busy on trying to find the proof. And you can say the same thing about economics professors right now. In many cases, they were still teaching both perspectives. And why would you teach both perspectives when you know that one of them is wrong? We don't teach that the sun is revolving around the earth anymore. I mean, that's a perspective, but it's wrong. This is the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Hi, I'm Christian Riley, and welcome to the Modern Monetary Theory Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can support the show by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. For as little as a dollar a month, you can get early access to all our episodes and patron-only episodes. A big thank you to all our supporters so far. At the beginning there, you heard our guest this week, economist, writer, real estate market strategist, and alternate member of the supervisory board of the Central Bank of Iceland, Olaf Makiasen. And in a moment, we're going to be talking with him about the economy of Iceland and his job guarantee proposal. In the conversation, you'll hear Olaf mention the UMKC Buckaroo, which is a currency launched by the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and it's a great way into understanding modern money if you're new to it. The currency itself, the actual Buckaroo notes, are, just like all manifestations of fiat currency, intrinsically worthless pieces of paper. So the challenge, as Warren Mosler, the founder of MMT, puts it, is to find a way to turn litter into money. The way the buckaroo works is that in order for students to get their grades at the end of a semester, they have to pay 20 buckaroos to the university, who then get to decide what students have to do to earn buckaroos. And in this case, the university opted for volunteer work at various community organisations. So in addition to supplying the community with student labour, This exercise is aimed at showing students the difference between the issuer of a currency and the users of a currency. For the issuer, the university, there's no shortage of currency. It's literally spent into existence. The university could have chosen to pay students in something they had no control over the supply of, like, say, gold. But then their capacity to further the public purpose would have been limited by an external constraint rather than the will of the community. Or the university could have chosen to use blades of grass as its currency. But then, of course, the students, the users of the currency, could just grab what they needed to pay their tax bills from lots of places rather than do work to provision the community, which would have defeated the whole purpose of the exercise. So... Two conditions that turn litter into money are one, that the supply of currency tokens is completely under the control of a monopoly issuer, and two, that the issuer can impose obligations denominated in those tokens. And in this case, the users of the currency, the students, have to get buckaroos and pay them back to the university to avoid penalties. And the university, the issuer, because it's the monopoly issuer and monopolists are price setters, The university defines what the currency is worth by saying what the users of the currency have to do in order to get units of it. And since the day it was launched, the value of the buckaroo has always been defined as one hour of student labour. Students who don't want to work for buckaroos can buy them with other currencies from other students who've earned more buckaroos than they need to settle their tax obligations. And in the decade or so after its launch, the value of the buckaroo actually increased from 5 to 15 US dollars a piece. So this underlines how an internally stable currency fixed to the value of labour with a zero interest rate policy, i.e. the currency user doesn't offer a guaranteed rate of return to savers of the currency, a currency like this can not only strengthen against other currencies, but can even outperform the stock market. And you can hear more about that from Warren Mosler in his own words in our episode 20. This university-issued currency works in the same way as many state-issued currencies, such as those of the US, the UK, Japan, Canada or Australia. In these cases, the state needs to provision itself, and so to 
bring resources into public sector use. It lays on a tax denominated in its unit of account, its dollars, its pounds, its yen, its unique tokens, which no one else is allowed to issue. And this tax liability creates a nation of currency users, people who need to sell their time and labour to get pounds or dollars or yen to pay their taxes with. And the government can then spend its otherwise worthless pieces of paper into existence to provision itself. Now, if you're new to this, I know it feels like I'm saying that it's just pure coercion driving this model of how and why money comes into being. And I know that people of all political stripes hate coercion. But consider that the story starts with a state that needs to provision itself. And I'd argue that whether you're an NHS loving extremist like me or a libertarian who needs his, let's face it, it's always a he, property rights enforcing, both of those situations require some level of governance, which is where the need for collective action arises. So I'm not arguing that governments should or shouldn't provision themselves this way. I'm asserting that whether we like it or not, governments do provision themselves this way. Modern money systems like the one I just described are the policy tool they use to achieve the things they were voted in to do. And I think the better we understand how and why they function, the more informed and therefore the more democratic we become. Another way we can do this is to have our aspirations limited by the amount of gold we've got locked in a vault somewhere, but historically we've always had to abandon that when we've needed to do something pressing like, say, fight a war. And arguably, we need that kind of large scale mobilization right now to tackle climate catastrophe or various health crises or the ubiquity of Piers Morgan. A threat to civilization is a threat to us all. Also, similar to last week's episode, the topic of endogenous money creation comes up. Again, this is the recognition that commercial banks don't lend out other people's money to borrowers. Rather, they create new money, new bank deposits denominated in the state's unit of account when they lend. And they can do that because they're agents of government in that respect. I gave a brief overview of that in the intro to last week's episode. It's a bit complicated. So again, if you'd like to know more, you can listen to our episode 43 with Sam Levy, which I've linked to in the show notes. I've also linked to where you can follow and support Olaf McGearson's work and also to a list of online MMT events and courses, including one run by a friend of the show, Dr. Dirk Entz, on modern monetary theory and European macroeconomics, which runs from the 9th to the 13th of August 2021. The application deadline for that is July the 26th. Hopefully see you there virtually, of course. And as ever, I've linked to where you can support this podcast financially via patreon.com slash MMT podcast. Support starts at a dollar a month, which is 72 British pence at the time of recording. And no matter what level of support you give, you get early access to all of our episodes and patron only episodes where you can ask me and Patricia MMT questions. We are 100% listener funded. Your financial support really helps keep the show going and your support in other ways, whether it's by recommending us to other people or just by listening and spreading the word about this stuff really helps too. So thanks as ever for the time you've put into understanding standing MMT. Let's dive in. Welcome one and all to the MMT podcast. I'm Christian Riley. And I'm Patricia Pino. And we are delighted to welcome real estate market strategist, economist and writer, including for outlets such as the Financial Times and Le Monde, and alternate member of the supervisory board of the Central Bank of Iceland. It's Olaf Mackiusson. Olaf, how are you doing? I'm well, thank you. So, Olaf, you've done so much. I get worn out just reading your biography. Um, can you tell us how you came to be interested in economics and how you came to MMT? As you can imagine, it's a bit of a long story, but maybe I'll try and you know cut down on the on the most sort of basic things. So it was already back in college that I had like sort of an idea of I wanted to try it, and I took economics as a as a secondary sort of choice. In college, really liked it, went to university, finished the bachelorette in economics in the University of Iceland, and that was back in 2008. And that was a very standard neoclassical economics bachelor of science degree. Went to the UK, did a master in money and banking at the University of Exeter. And the plan was always to go back to Iceland and continue to work in the Icelandic banking system where I had been working since 2008 four actually that didn't happen so i ended up doing a phd in economics at the university of exeter 
And then life took me to Switzerland. And now I live and work in Switzerland. And I look at the Icelandic economy a bit from abroad and try to sort of introduce people to how the economy with regards to especially banking and fiscal policy really work in comparison to the neoclassical economics that I learned back in the University of Iceland. So that's basically how I ended up in a very, very short version of the whole thing. Okay. Can you remember your light bulb moment with MMT? Was it a light bulb moment or was it just something you kind of you had worked out for yourself anyway? It wasn't MMT specifically. It was more towards post-Keynesian economics. I remember in so December 2008, that was after the Icelandic banking system had collapsed a couple of months prior to that. In December 2008, I'm flying back home for Christmas. And I was reading a book by George Cooper, The Origin of Financial Crisis, if I remember correctly the title. And there I read the name Minsky. And I figured out, well, this is is an economist I've never heard of. I definitely need to Google this guy and see what he wrote. And I read about Minsky, read about his financial instability hypothesis, based my PhD actually quite extensively on his work. And from Minsky, I read a bit of his work on jobs. And there I jumped essentially towards uh, functional finance. Uh, Steve Keen was also an economist that I read quite a lot of in around 2011 and 12. I read the debunking economics book around that time. And there, basically, I ended up reading Stephanie Kelton, the paper about how essentially the issuing of bonds is not financing the government. And then I randomly came across the book by uh, Mostler, Soft Currency Economics. And then I was basically exposed to it. There was a light bulb moment. I wouldn't say like a specific one, but it was slowly but securely I realized that this was more of how the economy was really working. And I think one of the light bulb moments, though, that I had was, like I said, definitely when I when I read the name Minsky in the airplane, and then likewise when I read first about endogenous money creation, because I had actually done that. I had booked mortgages into the accounting system of the bank that I had been working at, and I remember when I was reading the description of how endogenous money creation works. And I literally just realized like, yes, this is exactly how I booked it. Like, this is how it worked when I was buying mortgages of people that were issuing them to essentially borrowing money to buy houses. And so that was probably one of the the light bulbs moment as well. You mentioned the importance of Minsky. And we know he is extremely important to the MMT community. But we've never had an expert on Minsky on here before, as far as I know somebody who's done his PhD specifically on on Minsky. So could I ask you to explain perhaps in very simple terms what Minsky's hypothesis for financial stability is and why it's meaningful? Sure. I don't know if you can call me the specialist on Minsky, but I hopefully (laughs) I can answer the question that you had, certainly. So essentially you have Minsky's Financial instability hypothesis is one of the paradoxes, so to speak, in economics. You have the paradox of thrift, where Keynes was pointing out that if everybody saves, then actually the economy goes further down into the hole. And the financial instability hypothesis is a bit of a similar sort of paradox with the sense of that stability is destabilizing. And it's destabilizing because people, they look at the economy at any given time, usually the the sort of the story is set up in such a way that it is right after a crisis or right after an economic downturn, and you have people basically rebuilding their balance sheets, and they you know they are very careful in making their financial plans. They make sure that they have plenty of equity and leverage is very low. And because leverage is low, they have a very secure financial structure. And because the financial structure is very secure and resilient to any outside shocks, usually their plans are realized, even if they have some unforeseen events happen. And because they then look back after the 
two or three years. So it takes them to realize that their plans previously, they were too careful. They look back and they say to themselves, well, you know, everything went really well. Actually, I could have taken on a bit higher leverage. And they, so they slowly start forgetting the lessons that they learned back during the crisis when it happened. And also because new people, they enter the industry, they don't have the same experience, they don't have the same memories. And so they look at the financial structure of investments or you know, when you're buying a house or whatever, and they say to themselves, well, we can totally take on a bit more leverage. And so they do. And so the next round, what happens is that they, some of them perhaps they may take on too much leverage and they end up actually going bankrupt. But in total, you can see that the overall systematic leverage is still low enough for there to be resilience in the system for it to be able to absorb the shocks. And then comes another uh, round of people you know, asking themselves, should we have taken a bit more leverage? And many people, they will say yes, especially because they look at the people that had taken on a higher leverage and they realize that those people, they had made a lot of money and they want to basically catch up. So leverage ratio and the attitude towards taking on leverage builds up. And because it builds up, you introduce a systematic fragility into the system. So at some point, something happens. It literally can be simply due to a completely endogenous event, maybe somebody had an accident or, you know, it can be exogenous and can be endogenous. It doesn't matter. But at some point, some party will default on the loan that they took out in order to finance whatever they were financing. And that party then needs to sell the asset that they had bought with the loan in order to reduce their LTV and repay the loan. And what happens then essentially is that because the asset has been introduced onto the asset market, prices of the assets which previously had been going up, one reason behind the asset price rises was simply because people were taking on more leverage and pumping more more money into the asset market with the consequential effect of higher asset prices. And then all of a sudden, basically, the rise in asset prices stops or it slows down. And as it slows down, it introduces more people being exposed to their very now optimistic plans of making money with leverage to fail. As their plans fail, they end up in the same conundrum, essentially, as the first party that needed to sell the asset. And so they need to sell the asset. And then, essentially, you start a feedback cycle. And now the feedback cycle is negative rather than positive, as, as it was. Or it's, it's vicious instead of virtuous. And you then basically create a crass because everybody is trying to offload the assets at the same time. Everybody is trying to delever at the same time. And you end up with a financial crisis. Is this what they call fire sales by any chance? This could be exactly it. This can be a fire sale. Or uh, essentially, this is the Minsky moment. The Minsky moment is when enough number of people have taken on so much leverage that they have introduced such a high systematic fragility into the financial system that when something, something literally happens to the plans of one of those parties and they fail, the Minsky moment is when they need to start selling and the asset price starts diving instead of rising. And you mentioned Minsky and this seems incredibly important, especially after 2008. You also mentioned when you became acquainted with the idea that banks create money as they lend you also, if I'm not mistaken, you work for the Central Bank of Iceland just before the crash. So you have a good understanding of all these things. But I'm wondering, what are your thoughts with regards to the mainstream and why even something as simple as banks creating money as they lend, why is that been so difficult for them to absorb or to adopt or to incorporate in any way in their theories? Let me first correct you. So I, I worked for a commercial bank called Kaupthing before 2008, and I only joined the supervisory board of the central bank in 2017. But to answer your question, so to a large extent, it is a bit of a psychological task to realize that what you thought before was wrong. Not many people, not everybody is or are willing to accept it, that they need to change their minds. And it's like Galbraith said, 
if you are faced with the task of changing your mind or searching for some sort of a proof that you were correct all the time, most people, they get busy on trying to find the proof. And in many cases, especially if you're in some sort of a protected sort of institution or, you know, the institution can be, you know, it can be a bank, it can be an education institution, or it literally can just be the sort of society of economists. If you are in such a institution or society, you don't often want to rock the boat and try to realize that, hey, actually, money isn't created via the exogenous theory. It's actually created by the endogenous theory. And as such, we need to actually totally change the way that we manage the financial system. Hmm. Patricia, you've kind of gone into studying mainstream macro now, haven't you? But you, you've kind of been inoculated <laughs> before you went in, <laughs> basically. Yeah. But one, one of the interesting things, I mean, um, now that, you know, spending five years kind of seeing the differences between the mainstream and MMT theories, it's interesting for me to kind of take that psychological perspective that Olaf is talking about. And I can clearly see that as something as simple as bank money creation, which, you know, it, it's been the Bank of England released a paper to five years ago. It should be in common knowledge by now. It seems something that people don't talk about very loudly. And it's like they know it, but they don't want to bring it up because it's almost like this fear that you're going to have to change a lot of things if you take it seriously. Yeah. I mean, look at, for example, what happened to the economics studies or, or the universities in, in the UK after 2009, when the Manchester University economic uh, studies rep reform pressure was arising. In the end, there were some you know, amendments to curriculums here and there. They added you know, perhaps a tiny bit of financial history here and there. But in many cases, they were still teaching both perspectives. And why would you teach both perspectives when you know that one of them is wrong? We don't teach that the sun is revolving around the earth anymore. I mean, that's a perspective, but it's wrong. So why would you teach exogenous money creation? Yeah, it's an open question, isn't it? Inertia. And like you say, there's a power dynamic at work, isn't there? There's reputations, yeah, status on the line for the people who, who are late to the party, basically. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, if you if I can be a bit cheeky, think about all the presentation slides that need to be changed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all the books. All the books. Exactly. Of course. Yeah. ISLM model doesn't work anymore. What are they going to teach? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's a crazy thing. We, we already knew that, you know, back in 1981 or in 1882 that Hicks actually said, you know, don't teach this stuff. Yeah. I'm wrong. Keynes was saying something much more. But everybody listened to Hicks when they were, you know, when he was trying to sort of simplify Keynes and the general theory. And then later on, when he realized that he had been wrong, but by that time, Hicks had you know, the ISLM was part of the mainstream. And even if he was the sort of the author or main, the main author behind the model, and he was trying to correct it, nobody was listening to him. We can certainly include a link to that paper, actually, is one that... Oh, yeah. I found it quite funny because he was rubbishing his own theory, basically. Well, you know, it's, it's like Kane said, at some point, people realize that the facts have changed and they change their minds. You know, fair play for him for saying fair it play. out loud. Absolutely, fair play. <laughs> and I say it for myself, it took me a while to realize that, you know, something had been wrong. It took me four years to do my bachelor's. And I thought to myself, like, no, but this can't be. I mean, you know, what was I learning during my bachelor's studies if, if then all of it or, you know, 80% of it is basically not useful in the end to learn and study and understand the dynamics in the economy. And I actually had this conversation with one of the teachers at the University of Iceland, and he flat out said that the purpose of learning Bachelor of Science of Economics at the University of Iceland, at least before 2008, was to prepare the students for a master's or a PhD studies abroad. It was not to understand the economy. It was to prepare them for a career in academia. Mm. And who are the biggest employers, I guess? Could be, exactly. But I thought to myself, like, engineers, what do they learn during their bachelor's? 
they actually learn some practical things. They don't set up some theory that doesn't work in reality and then they study just the theory. They actually try to understand, you know, the function of matters and, you know, physics, etc. And they apply it to the reality. But for some reason, many, you know, bachelor level of universities or, or, or bachelor level of economic studies, they don't seem to follow this sort of principle. In a way, that kind of connects to the origin story of MMT. It didn't come from academia. It actually came from somebody who kind of has an engineer's perspective, which is Warren yep. Mosler. You know, he wants to know how the mechanics of things worked. And as somebody in the, in the finance industry, he's looking at the mechanisms and drawing his conclusions from that. So I guess that's, uh, that's kind of why that happened. But I think a great way into MMT for any beginners is your article that uh, you wrote recently. And the title was, The State Can Afford This But Should It? And at the beginning, you pose a question which goes like this. Before the Icelandic krona was established in the last years of the 19th century, how many Icelandic krona were in circulation? Now, can you take it from there, Olaf? Sure. So before the creation of the Icelandic krona by law, the medium of, of payment or the, the currency that was used in, in Iceland was the Danish krona. Iceland was a colony of, of Denmark. We only got our independence in 1944. And, you know, step by step, we had some pressure on getting more sort of independence. So we, that was the political will. And so the Icelandic krona was created in the, the last years of the 19th century, simply thanks to or due to the political will of Icelanders to control themselves, essentially. And one of that was that they wanted to increasingly control their own finances. And so the Icelandic krona was by law uh, created. And, and at some point, the, the legislature simply said, you need to pay your taxes in Icelandic krona. But the problem, obviously, was that there were no Icelandic kronas in, in circulation. So they needed to get them into circulation somehow. And they simply did the same trick as, as so many governments have done before. They simply just spent them into existence and then they taxed them back. And of course, this is essentially the same thing as, as happens still today. You know, the United States does it, the Japanese government does it, the British, the Swedish, the Norwegian, the Icelandic, they all do the same thing. They, they create the money first so that taxes can be paid and they spend them basically, or, you know, they literally just create them into existence with ink or, you know, by striking some keyboards. And that was... In the beginning, of course, the, the problem was to create some sort of a trust in the system. And in the beginning, the Icelandic krona was packed to the Danish krona as a, a one for one. And over the years, what has happened is that the Icelandic krona has actually lost around 99% or so of, of its value against the Danish krona. So the exchange rate now is maybe around 20 or one against 20 or so. But we actually took two zeros off all prices back in 1981 or two, if I remember correctly. So in reality, the exchange rate now in comparison to the original exchange rate, which was one-on-one, -on -one, is around one against 2,000. And so this is the what has sort of been always a problem in Iceland is that there has been a high reliance on imports. And the high reliance on imports has been there because the economy is not diversified enough to a large extent. We don't manufacture you know, any computer goods or cars or petroleum or anything like that. We need to import all this stuff. All the investment goods, they all need to be imported. We are dependent on exports in order to find or source essentially the foreign exchange that we need in order to pay for the imports. But it doesn't really matter with regards to how the public finances work in Iceland. From an operational point of view, they work exactly the same way as in the US, but the constraints are perhaps simply different. And that's where this term about monetary sovereignty kicks in, which is so important and has been highlighted, for example, the African economies now by uh, Fadel Kaboub, for example. Yeah, and the CFA franc and uh, that sort of colonial legacy. Yes, exactly. Is this why there has been plans or suggestions that Iceland should peg its currency, well, to the euro or to just join the eurozone? Is that well received in Iceland? 
That has been exactly. So many people, they are tired of the currency, the Icelandic currency, because they simply do not have faith in its long-term purchasing power, essentially. In the end, what happens is that, or what has happened is that the Icelandic krona, which is a metric, it's a unit of account, just like a, the US dollar or anything, it has been personalized. It has been created. As it's By now, it's a persona. And you, you can blame the persona for the problems of the economy, rather than to actually understand what's going on in the economy and try to figure out, right, okay, those are the underlying problems, and they are reflected by the fact that the purchasing power is actually of the currency is, is falling. So yeah, we, we are basically pointing a finger and we're not pointing the finger at the right person. We, we're pointing at a dead thing. We're pointing at a unit of account when we in reality should be actually pointing at ourselves and realizing, okay, there is something wrong in the economy. What is it? I love that. I'm going to use that. <laughs> That's very interesting because in the Eurozone, obviously the economies that are suffering in the Eurozone are suffering precisely because of the Euro, the whole mechanism. And they don't point the finger at the currency when really they should. And it's the exact opposite of the situation you're talking about, Olaf. So I think actually the problem with the euro is essentially, so the euro, just like the, the Icelandic krona, is just a metric. I mean, it's a, it's a unit of account. You don't blame a meter or an inch. Sure. For messing something. But I mean, the arrangement whereby the governments are not sovereign in Euro, they've ceded the sovereignty. Yes, exactly. And that's the underlying problem. We do not have a common fiscal policy in the Eurozone like we do in other successful currency areas. And in order for the currency area to be stable and prosperous in the longer run, you need to have some sort of a mechanism underneath it that can absorb the shock and distribute the shock. And if that mechanism isn't there in the form of allowing exchange rates to fluctuate, you need to make sure that the mechanism is there in the form of a common fiscal policy. This is what was pointed out back in 1992 uh, when Godley wrote the, the Maastricht and all that. I mean, it's a fantastic article. We'll get back to the Eurozone in a minute, but I was interested, what do you put the purchasing power declining down to of the Icelandic krona? Because Warren Mosler would say when the government pays more for the same thing than it did yesterday, it's revising the value of its currency downward. And that's the thing that uh, weakens the purchasing power of a currency. First of all, what do you think about that? And do you have any other thoughts? I think he's right. But I also think that I heard Mosler, for example, be, you know, describe the, uh, the UMKNC and the Denison system that they have, where essentially the issuer of the currency, there is only one issuer of the currency and the one issuer of, of the money itself. So the money supply is entirely controlled. In Iceland, you have the same setup in the sense that you know, the, the Icelandic government is the sole sort of, or the, the central bank right now, because it's via the central bank, like in other economies, that the, the government spends or creates the, the money into existence. So the government can do this. And this is essentially the same sort of system as they have in the UMKSC. But you also have a, another creator of money in the economy, and that is the banking system. And the banking system in Iceland is by far more responsible of the creation of money than the government. So perhaps the best example of this is back in the 1970s and the 60s or the 70s, especially when you had the oil shock. So the oil shock basically, especially for a small sort of monotous or you know very, very simple economy like the Icelandic economy was back then, is a massive supply side shock. It introduces costs into the manufacturing and the, basically the production of whatever you're producing in the economy. And you need something to finance the higher price level because the price level, the you need to finance the costs somehow. And the costs are coming from abroad via higher oil price. So what you do as, a, as an importer, you perhaps go to your bank and you say, hey, listen, I have this problem right here. I need to pay 110 krona now instead of 100 like last year for this import because we have a negative current account deficit and we are having a pressure on the exchange rate. And therefore, we 
I need the, the cash, I need the financing in order to basically buy in all the imports that I need in order to produce whatever I want to produce and hire the people, etc. And the banker says, not a problem, I will finance this and I will finance this at, you know, I will finance the whole 110. And it's not the government in that case, which is financing the higher costs, it's the banking system. And then the producer takes the money and, you know, he pays for all the, the production, he gets some profit back and he repays the loan. And the government really doesn't touch anything. It doesn't influence or anything right here, because essentially this is just the Italian circuit theory. You need to approach the banking system in order to finance your production. And if you have a cost shock in your production, which leads you to pay higher prices for the essentially the cost of production, it doesn't matter if the government doesn't say, no, I'm not going to finance this because the banking system will. Yeah. I mean, the way Warren talks about that is he will say, when banks create money, they're acting as agents of the government. So, you know, I think that's the way he would say. Yes, you can say that. Absolutely. You know, in the end, I mean, the it's the government that sets the law which allows the banks to do this. Mm. But it's not the government expenditures which are pushing up the price level. It's the banking system's financing of the higher costs in the economy. I think I'm sympathetic to both Warren's position and all, what all of his saying because I, I think that if we accept that you know money is endogenous, even if the money creation is done on the terms uh, set by the government, it is still the ultimate quantity of money is beyond its control. We we know that so there, there are it's not controlling day to day money creation; it's just controlling the general idea of the terms under which that is done. Yeah, it's controlling by price. Yeah. At least that's the idea. Yeah, right, yeah. But price is where, is where the problem is if the purchasing power is going down in the case of the kroner. So would you say that that pretty much scans Olaf, whereby, okay, so prices in kroner are going up and the private sector, with the government's blessing, are paying the higher prices? Yes, and, they, and essentially they finance the higher prices you know, with extra loans from the, the banking system. There's a second round effect in this as well. And that's the fact that once the higher price has been realized, the government actually most of the time accepts that they need to pay higher prices. So it's very difficult to nail down exactly where are you going to stop the spiral, essentially, because at some point you cannot, I mean, the problem that Iceland has is that it is so dependent on imports. One third of the CPI basket, the goods basket behind the CPI, is from abroad. And you know the rule of thumb is if the Kronas current um, exchange rate goes down by 10%, you will have a 3% inflation over the next 12 months or so, roughly. To what extent is this being exacerbated by speculation or borrowing for speculation against the currency? Is that a problem in Iceland? Yes, it definitely was. And there was another, and still is, another fundamental problem with the Icelandic financial system that makes everything a lot more difficult to keep under control and to influence, for example, with prices or else in with, and when I say prices, I mean interest rates of loans. And that is the fact that we use a lot of indexation. So indexation on Credit is common around the world. You have the US uh, government bonds, they are indexed towards the CPI. You have the German bonds, you have France, Swedish, whatever not. The largest issuer of CPI indexed loans in Iceland is not the government, but the household sector. Mortgages in Iceland are still today, the ratio was much higher uh, before, but still today, the vast majority of the stock of mortgages in the economy are actually indexed. And they are indexed in such a way that it is not the interest rates that go up with the CPI. It is the principal that goes up with CPI. So if you have the CPI going up from 100 to 110, and you took out a loan of 1,000 krona one year ago, you don't owe 1,000 krona today. You owe 1,100 krona. Oh, wow. What happens on this is that when the banks look at the nominal change in the principal, they book it as profits. 
And higher profits, they lead to a better equity position for the banks. And a better equity position means higher capital. And higher capital means that they can push out more loans. And more loans means that they can finance higher costs, which feed back into the indexation. Wow. So, you know, if you were solely in charge of fixing this problem, what would be your recommendation? I would dump it immediately. I have been writing about this for probably about 10 years. The reason for why this indexation was adopted was back in 1979 was exactly because of the high inflation. So we started Iceland back in the early 1970s. We always had a very strong labor union or labor unions, actually. I think around 90% or so of workers in Iceland, they are in a labor union. And the labor unions back in the early 60s, they were pushing on a pension system to be set up. And that was set up in the early 1970s, but the inflation episodes during the the oil price expansion, essentially, uh, or the oil price sort of uh, fuel of the inflation, drove the purchasing power of the pension savings downwards. And so it was a pressure from the pension system that they adopted this indexation. And one of the reasons for it as well was that many people thought that they needed to have indexation in order to push savings into the banks so that banks could create loans, which is the exogenous money creation. When in reality, that doesn't work, of course. You know, no banking system doesn't work like that, and certainly not the Icelandic banking system. So in the 1970s, so 1979, the indexation is adopted and Ever since then, essentially, real interest rates in Iceland, they have been very, very high. And this is back to what MMT taught us as well and what has been influential in in my thinking as well is that high interest rates, actually, you need to finance this cost just as well as any other cost, whether it's higher oil prices or high interest rates. You need to create the money or you need to create the financing in order to finance that cost. And so high interest rates, and often they can actually push inflation upwards simply because of the the higher cost that is that the higher interest rates are introducing. This was super influential back in, especially after 2001. Iceland joins the European Economic Area in 1993, which actually had its impact on how the operations of the central bank and the treasury work, which is a bit of an off topic. But Because we joined the European Economic Area, we needed to allow capital flows into the economy. And that came around, if I remember correctly, in 1996 or 1997, basically fully. And we had a fixed exchange rate back then, which was allowed to fluctuate plus minus 15% against the Deutsche Mark. And then comes the euro in 1999, and we go into full you know, very standard inflation target system in March 2001. And as you know, within the monetary policy of having a focusing on inflation as a target, you and with an open capital account, you need to or you try to influence the inflation in the economy by changing interest rates. But interest rates, as you can imagine, when markets in the economy are all indexed, they don't bite. They don't work right? because all the costs which are created because of inflation in usual environment, they basically lead to the central bank pumping up uh, or raising interest rates, which leads to a higher markets, nominal markets rates, which leads to higher cash flows of the markets, which then reduces the demand in the economy, which theoretically should reduce the inflation. In Iceland, this doesn't work because of the indexation. The indexation blocks the central bank from having the impact on cash flows of mortgages as central banks in usual economies do. And the central bank before 2008 didn't realize this. And so what they did in order to fight the inflation, instead of putting up credit controls or stopping some sort of, you know, somehow giving the banks window guidance like was in Japan, or credit controls like it was in France or the UK, you know, 50 years ago, they tried to influence inflation by in raising interest rates. And raising interest rates in an environment where you have an, uh, have an open capital account basically created the carry trade. And the more carry trade 
created more instability on the exchange rate. More instability on the exchange rate created more instability on the inflation. And so the central bank lost complete control. And the, basically, the atmosphere in the whole economy was very euphoric. Everybody wanted to get rich by buying uh, real estate. And we basically blew up a massive bubble. And that came down crashing in 2008. That's the a perfect storm of the interest income channel and Minsky, basically, isn't it? <laughs> and not only that, but also thinking that interest rates can influence inflation as per theory. Yeah. Because according to theory, indexation is amazing. You should use this actually quite nicely because, you know, as oxygen as money creation, you know, especially in an economy where you have high inflation rates, you should actually try to get people to put their money into the banks in order to finance, you know, more production, etc. But that's not how the banking system works. So from a neoclassical economics standpoint, everything was working absolutely fine. They just needed to change the interest rates in order to, you know, get control back into the central bank. But by raising interest rates, they introduced more fragility into the system via the carry trade, which then basically just made everything worse. Yeah, very clear, very clear. And ha have the lessons been learned since? Yes, there was, after 2008 and nine. there was, the capital account actually was closed off. Only recently did we open up the capital account. We now have more stringent conditions on LTVs, for example, for mortgages. And thankfully, because interest rates are now so low, people, they are staying away from index loans. Because as you can imagine, I mean, indexation, as I just described it, it literally just works as a loan, which is negative amortization. Because negative amortization works in such a way that you, you know, let's say that you have a, a mortgage with 5% uh, rate of interest, nominal rate of interest, you only pay 3%. And you add the 2% on top of the principal. Oh, that sounds horrible. <laughs> this is exactly the same way as the indexation makes mortgages in Iceland work. And the vast stock of mortgages in Iceland are still indexed. So is that a deferred interest mortgages? I think we, ha we have those here, don't we? Yes. I think actually that's the UK term for it. Exactly. An American term for it is negative amortization. I see that in, in the 80s, Iceland had high inflation, like many countries at the time, because of the oil shock, I guess. But you also had relatively low unemployment, unlike many countries. Could you say a bit about that? Yeah. So back in the 1980s, the political will was simply that we were going to keep unemployment low. And again, the financing for that didn't really come from the government. It came from the banking system. And back in the 1980s, we also had entirely different monetary policy. Monetary policy back in the 1970s and 80s was adjusted so that the fishing industry would be profitable. Because the fishing industry back in the 1970s and 80s was by far the largest export industry. And in order to maintain profitability in the fishing industry, they needed often to allow the currency to devalue. And what happens then is the cost of imports goes up and inflation goes up. But this was accepted because the exports in the 1980s, they were so monotone. What does monotone mean, sorry? Uh, simple. There, there was a very, the variability in exports was, was very low. It was just fishing industry and that was it. Right, right. Got it. So the fishing industry needed to have profits and needed to be operational in order to maintain the flow of currency or foreign currency into the economy in order for us to be able to pay for the imports. If something happened, you know, say that the fishing stock went down, we actually, early 1970s, we completely overfished herring away from the, the natural resources that we have. I mean, the, the fishing industry almost wiped out the, the herring stock entirely. And we had a quite a bit of an economic crisis in the 19, 1970s because the herring went away, as in we overfished it. And because we had, I mean, literally, it was one single industry that depicted the growth of the economy, and that was the fishing industry. So just backing up to the great financial crisis, what were the policy responses to that? So it was a bit of a shock. 
essentially, uh, as you can imagine, ninety percent of the of the banking system went bankrupt. We tried. The government did its absolute best, and the central bank as well, to keep the banks alive. They tried to bail them out, but they couldn't. And unfortunately, in in foreign media, this was depicted as we chose to let the banks go bankrupt, but we didn't do that. We tried to keep them alive. The perception was that there there were a lot of protests about this and that the government had kind of uh, accepted the will of the people and in all this and... Is that not what happened then? <laughs> no, that's not what happened. They absolutely tried to keep the banking system running up until the very last night before they, they collapsed. Ma the majority of the foreign exchange reserves that we had in September 2008, if I remember correctly, about a month before the collapse happened, was lent to one single bank. And it was 500 million euros. And that was, that was literally the firepower that the central bank had to try and bail out the banks. The bank's problem was that they owed foreign currency. And throughout the whole year of 2008, the central bank pumped Icelandic krona into the banks, which they took and they exchanged for foreign currency in order to be able to keep themselves alive with the obvious impact of the currency collapsing. But that was the, the only sort of gun. That was the only tool that the central bank had. The need that the banks had was for a foreign currency, but the Central Bank of Iceland cannot create foreign currency. They can only lend out krona as much as they want. They will never go bankrupt in Icelandic krona, obviously. But if the banks needed US dollars, the, the Central Bank of Iceland hardly had any. I mean, the banks in the UK, if I'm not mistaken, had a, had a similar problem in the sense that they needed dollars to carry on and, and some arrangement was made between central banks in the US. I'm just surprised that the US is, didn't help this out. Did the Icelandic banks, you know, by defaulting presumably in dollar payments, for example, not would that not affect them? Is that not in their interest to help out? Mm, well, the Icelandic banking system, sure, it was 10 times the economy of Iceland, but the economy of Iceland is 300,000 people. So essentially, you don't really have a large enough systematic impact even if you go bankrupt. Let's put it this way. We are not too big to fail. <laughs> it has its benefits, doesn't it? Sure. I mean, you know, we, we tried to set up a swap line with the Federal Reserve, just like the Bank of England had a swap line with the Federal Reserve in order to serve the needs of the, the British banks for uh, US dollars. We tried to do the same, but it simply failed. And in the end, we ran out of foreign currency. But we absolutely tried to save the banks, contrary to, unfortunately, what the foreign media has been saying. People will be interested to hear about that. So what happens? What does it look like on the ground? Was it literally all of the banking sector got wiped out or just most of it? 90% in 10 days. Wow. wow. If you measure it by the percentage of assets, it was 90% of the total banking system in 10 days. It was the largest banking collapse if I'm not mistaken, ever by percentage, by size, relative. Yes, I believe that is correct. And so what is happening in that situation? You've got, you know, the ordinary Icelander in the street can't take money out of the bank. They just don't have a, a bank account anymore. Is But what does it look like if you're an ordinary person in, in Iceland? So that never actually failed. So the, the domestic payment system never failed. The payment system with abroad did fail. Because, and this is something that MMT taught me as well, always look at the mechanics of what's going on with regards to the payment system. So the correspondent banks that the Icelandic banks had in, for example, the US was uh, Morgan Stanley, if I remember correctly, or JP Morgan. And so when Captain Bank went bankrupt, the connection in the payment system to abroad was severed. And the same thing happened with the other two banks, uh, Glitnir and, uh, and Landsbankin. And so essentially what happened was that the Icelandic payment system is isolated. So you cannot, it's very difficult to import and export. And what happened was that the central bank actually needed to activate its own sort of channels with regards to making sure that the international payment system was accessible for the domestic Icelandic financial system. And that took quite a lot of effort, but it, they managed to do that in the end. What saved the domestic financial system or the domestic payment system was that the central bank 
in Iceland is the ultimate clearinghouse of payments. And it is the only clearinghouse of payments. So contrary to, for example, the UK payment system, where you have the local you know, saving societies, etc., they are perhaps using their bank account at, say, Royal Bank of Scotland to pay to another housing society. So if Royal Bank of Scotland goes or RBC goes bankrupt, then they end up with not being able to participate in the domestic UK payment system. So you basically have a two-layer system in the UK when in Iceland you only have one layer. All the banks, they are directly connected to the central bank and they all clear payments between themselves using the central bank money and not the, the credit or the liabilities of a, another bank. And so when the Icelandic banks went bankrupt, 90%, uh, if you look at the assets, what the central bank did was that they simply set up a, another company on the same level, essentially in the payment system as the old bankrupt estates of the banks were. And they put all the domestic deposits, etc., into those new banks. And those new banks, they were in the ownership of the bankrupt estates. The new banks then connected their own payment system to the central bank. And the central bank literally just continued clearing payments between the new banks, just as they had done it with the, the old banks. And it was pure luck that this system was in place before the crash. If this one layer system hadn't been in place, we would have had the problem of people not being able to use their debit cards and credit cards, etc. But literally, they, like everybody was using the same debit card you know, in September as they were using it in October and the financial system collapsed in October and they had the same bank account numbers and everything. Nothing changed. They literally just put up another sort of, you know, call it a holding company that was directly connected to the payment system straight into the central bank. And so again, as I read it, and it's probably a superficial reading of the situation, things look to have settled down by say 2014. Inflation's down to 2%, unemployment's down to 5%, which would be, you know, good for us or America. <laughs> you know, that's high for you guys. <laughs> um, but, you know, would you say the average Icelander experienced the economy post-2014? Was it much different to before the crisis? It was definitely different. I mean, I haven't lived back in Iceland since 2008, but I can totally see how people looked at the economy much differently post-2008 and pre-2008. Fortunately, exactly, we had you know, a huge and quick drop in inflation once the exchange rate pass-through had gone through. I mean, by, if I remember correctly, inflation in, in 2009 was above 15%. It was, it was around 15 18%. And by 2010, we are down to 5%, which actually it lingered on around that time. For a couple of years. And then 2014, we, like I said, we're down to, to about 2%. And the biggest driver for that was the tourist industry. The Icelandic krona starts appreciating against other currencies around 2010 or so. And it basically just kept on going and going. It was flat for a couple of years. And then around 2012 or so, it starts appreciating. And just like a falling, Currency value introduces higher import costs, and appreciating currency introduces lower import costs. So inflation dropped largely because the tourist industry was expanding really, really quickly. Thanks to, for example, the the very simple advertisement of allowing a, a volcano back in 2010 to erupt and creating havoc around the whole of Europe, especially because nobody could pronounce their name. <laughs> Essentially, what happened was that you had a boom in the tourist industry and the currency appreciated. To what extent, I mean, you, you mentioned tourist industry, to what extent did the movie The Secret Life of Walter Mitty play in this? Because it seems like an advertisement for Iceland. Have you seen it? I have, yes. <laughs> I'm assuming it had a big impact on tourism as well. Yes, it did, actually. I mean, Prometheus, for example, Ridley Scott, if I remember correctly, that is recorded in Iceland. So is Walter Mitty. Um, there was scenes from Fast and the Furious at some point, if I remember correctly. They were recorded in Iceland. Tom Cruise came, did a movie or two 
Game of Thrones, obviously, you know, everything that happens uh, north of the wall basically happens in Iceland. So, yeah, there's been a huge impact on the tourist industry via the media, essentially, films and so on. So that's one. But another influential point was, I mean, the, the volcanic eruption to, in 2010 was a huge advertisement. You wouldn't have thought so, would you? You, <laughs> you would think it would have the opposite effect. Yes, but it was it was like some somehow Iceland managed to get three times lucky. It was absolutely incredible. First, what happened was that people thought that we had jailed the bankers <laughs> and you know allowed the, the the banks to go bankrupt. So that created some media attention on its own. It wasn't entirely correct, but okay, whatever. The media attention was there, and that was two thousand and nine or so. Two thousand and ten, we have the volcanic eruption and. You know, that obviously had a massive I impact as well. And then all of a sudden we could play football. Yeah. <laughs> and everybody loved us playing football. And people started, you know, I still remember when we beat England. I, I loved it, I have to admit. <laughs> everybody was wondering what about the Icelandic air was it that was creating these amazing footballers? Yes, ex exactly. <laughs> <laughs> because nobody beats England at football. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So essentially, we got three times lucky. It was free commercials, you know, at, at very sort of important points. And the tourist industry in Iceland grew, if I remember correctly, the the number of of tourists back in 2019 was around 2 million. And it had grown by around 20% per year since 2010. And you hear a lot about the data centers in Iceland as well. Is that... A recent development is that uh, another industry that is growing, and we also hear that that is uh, linked very much to Bitcoin mining, even though I'm sure it's not all of it. Our feelings about Bitcoin, because we're in tears, are, are quite strong. But do you see that as a threat to the system, or, or are you not concerned about that? Uh, you mean Bitcoin to the Icelandic economy? Yeah. No, 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 that's fine. I mean, yes, we have the data centers. So thankfully, the economy now is entirely different to how it was 40 years ago. The exchange rate pass-through is, is weaker now than before, simply because we have a bit more of a diverse economy. So yes, I mean, obviously, we have the fishing industry, which is very large. There are natural sort of boundaries on how much that industry can expand, as you can imagine. Then we have the tourist industry, at least before COVID. But You know, we, we certainly have a bit of the infrastructure now needed to have a successful and nature-conserving tourist industry. We definitely need to have a bit more of an infrastructure, but at least we have the hotels now. And then we have the aluminium smelters. They are foreign-owned, though. So obviously, all the profits, they are actually exported straight out of the economy. So the only thing that is really left is the wages that the aluminium smelters are paying in Iceland, along with you know, domestic services that they are buying from smaller manufacturing companies and so on. But interestingly enough, actually, uh, I want to use this opportunity to mention it. There are no thin capitalization rules uh, in Iceland. It's well known that the international aluminium smelters in, in Iceland, they are owned by international companies. They use intercompany loans in order to keep profits of the Icelandic company low so that the Icelandic company doesn't pay taxes. So they export the profits, so to speak, via the interest rates that they are paying on the intercompany loans. So they can literally have whatever intercompany loans, LTV, as they want, which is not actually too common. Uh, in many economies, you, can, you will have some sort of a withholding taxes on profits, or you will have rules on the capitalization that you can apply in on intercompany loans, but that's a different matter. And so, yeah, but in the end, we have as well quite a bit of a software industry as well. CCP, for example, is um, a famous games company. They have the EVE Online game. And there are some, some green sprouts here and there for in the IT sector in Iceland as well. So that's, that's definitely a very positive development towards a bit more diversity in the, in the economy as, as a whole. So just turning the corner a little bit, Your PhD thesis is called Financial Instability and Foreign Direct Investment. Big question. What should we know about the relationship about these two things? Well, at least when I wrote it, which is, it's been a while. Uh, it's been seven years since I handed in. 
but essentially essentially what I did there was that I I created indices using Minsky's financial instability hypothesis for financial fragility and financial instability essentially and then I made a very simple regression analysis on whether foreign direct investment had positive or, or negative uh, sort of correlation or, or impact on the financial stability. And likewise, if financial stability had actually positive or negative impact on FD, on foreign direct investment. And long story short, it was a bit inconclusive, but it was more leaning towards saying that foreign direct investment actually can introduce instability into the economy rather than stability. And the reason for it in many cases is that you will have, as long as you basically control the credit expansion from the banking system that happens at the same time, you minimize the risk of creating fragility into the economy alongside with the expansion of the foreign direct investment. So foreign direct investment, it has plenty of positive things. You should definitely not you know, discourage it, but you should realize that it's not you know, all good. You need to simply make sure that you are mitigating the negative impacts as well. So bringing it up to date and talking about the coronavirus pandemic, tell us about the government response, you know, in terms of lockdowns, income support, how did the government handle it? I mean, in the beginning, they did a decent job. Definitely. They expanded, uh, they were quite quick in creating uh, support. They supported uh, credit going towards the companies. They supported financial assistance to the households. I mean, overall, I think the response was, especially in the beginning, was actually quite good. They, there was a full lockdown, or not like a full lockdown, but essentially there was an extensive test and their you know, restaurants were closed. And obviously the economic shock was severe because the tourist industry was, was obviously decimated to a large extent. And later on, and now, the problem is that they are too afraid of fiscal deficits. You can see the, the conversation that is going on right now in Europe and, and the US that they are definitely going to use fiscal deficits going forward to make sure that the economy recovers quite quickly, or at least as quickly as they sort of dare to push it. But in Iceland right now, there is a bit of a fear that the government doesn't have the means to finance the deficit. And it's a very sort of classical response when you see it. You know, the deficit goes up. Uh, if I remember correctly, the, uh, the deficit in last year was around 8% or so. And they simply just want to cut back on it. They want to withdraw the support a bit. And I, I have been trying to convey the message like, hey, you do not need to be afraid of the deficit as long as you don't have inflation and if unemployment is high. And right now, unemployment in Iceland is even higher than in the US, which is very unusual, definitely. So on, on a harmonized sort of a basis, when you look at the harmonized unemployment figures between countries, you actually see that Iceland is, is above the US, still below the Eurozone. But if you look at just the domestic sort of, you know, non-harmonized and the non-seasonally adjusted figures, you can see that actually there are around 22,000 people unemployed. And the population of Iceland is roughly one pro mil, uh, so one thousandth of the population of the US. You can do the math if, if there are 22,000 persons unemployed in Iceland, that it's roughly the equivalent of 22 million in the US, plus minus. So unemployment is a huge problem. And I have been speaking about that they should adopt and create a job guarantee program. And yes, there is the risk of, of some sort of a leakage by uh, you know higher income for people, which they will be um, using for buying whatever they want to buy. And some part of that will be imported, which potentially can create pressure on the exchange rate, which then can create cost pressures, which then pushes up the inflation. But the current account is right now balanced. It's around zero. And if the job guarantee is focused on or you know, anything that is basically financed by the government, especially now because the, the banking system is not financing almost anything uh, within the... So net right now, the credit expansion coming from the banking system is going almost entirely to households 
which are using the credit expansion from the banks to buy existing assets being real estate. But the banking system is not financing anything, you know, net expansion of, of credit towards the the companies. And the companies they need obviously, you know, some financing in order to, you know, do investments and hire people, etc. And Either they don't want the money or the money is not forthcoming because the banks, they don't want to lend to an industry or industries which are struggling. So the government needs to step in to create the positive impact of spending and a job guarantee program would be one of them, especially if that would be focused towards making sure that, you know, the knowledge within the labor, you know, within people in Iceland was, was growing and allowing them then to basically become more productive, for example, in the export industries in general. So we'll link to your uh, policy note from the Global Institute of Sustainable Prosperity. That policy note is called Iceland. We need to talk about unemployment and a job guarantee. And let's get into the details of how much would the proposed uh, job guarantee job pay? Yeah, so minimum pay in Iceland right now actually is around 350,000 kroner. And, you know, it, it depends on what the, the currency is or the exchange rate is every day. But, you know, it's around $2,700 per month, plus minus. And so essentially, that would be the effective minimum wage. You know, I, I am proposing paying that to people that literally just want to educate themselves in, you know, anything new which they realize is needed in order to, for example, prepare themselves for the fourth industrialization. Because sooner or later, people will start losing their jobs because they can be automated. And in that case, you need to make sure that you have upgraded skills amongst people in the economy, which can be used to work on computers and whatever not. And a job guarantee and education via a job guarantee program would be one of them. And I think it would be beneficial in the longer run to pay people for educating themselves. Just to, for clarification, it's 2,700 US dollars a month. If I'm not mistaken, that, that is higher than the British minimum wage at the moment. I was going to say in the paper, um, Olaf, you say that it's about $14.13 an hour. So it's, it kind of chimes in with the US fight for 15, doesn't it? Yes. I mean, it's 350,000 divided by roughly 172 or so. That's 2034. But that's what it is right now. Yeah, it was increased, actually. It grew from 335,000 krona to 350,000 on the 1st of January. I mean, yes, right now, the minimum wage is around $16 per hour. Yeah. Are costs quite high in Iceland in terms of rent? Um, Yes, they are. Yeah, okay. Yes, definitely. It's usually Norway, Iceland and Switzerland, which warm the top three when it comes to price levels. So that minimum wage, I mean, it seems like a silly question, but is it enough? Sustainable? Probably not. Right. You do not do a lot with 350000 a month in Iceland, at least not in Reykjavik, uh, especially if you need to pay rent, etc. You can get by on it for you know some time, but if something unexpected happens, you, know, you make it sick or whatever not, uh, then it obviously becomes very difficult. But also, I guess, in the, well, also you've got a very strong social safety net there. Am I right about that? Yes, we do. The government provides you with the minimum supply of, of healthcare. You can walk in into the hospitals and, you, you know, in case of a cancer treatment or anything like that, it's paid by the government. Anything large uh, is essentially covered by the government. You have high unemployment benefits, the unemployment benefits now in comparison to at least uh, many other countries. The unemployment benefits now, they are around 300,000 ISK. Uh, so we're talking about 2,300 uh, US per month. Okay, so, so we're not talking about if we were to change that for a minimum wage, that was, it's not a huge difference then between increasing that. It will be an increase from 300,000 up to 350,000. So it's about what, 17% or so, plus minus. But then the, the creation of employment potentially would have a deflationary effect? Am I I right to say that? Well, I mean, right now, the thing is, if you're going to hire somebody right now, you obviously need to pay the minimum wage. So the minimum wage is higher than the unemployment benefits. 
And the unemployment system actually in Iceland functions a bit differently as well. So if you have lost your job from a high paying job, you keep your income, your high income for a bit of a while, if I remember correctly, for about six months before you drop down to the absolute bare minimum, which is 300,000. And if you introduce a job guarantee scheme where you have 350,000 Icelandic krona per month, so that's $2,700 dollars per month or roughly $16 per hour, you basically you will have two parallel systems. You can still choose to be on the unemployment benefits as you would today, or you can say, okay, now I want to you know, forfeit uh, my unemployment benefits, especially if I have now dropped down to the bare minimum, which is 300,000 krona, and I can go into a job guarantee scheme, which pays me 350,000. And within the job guarantee scheme, there can be various different activities, including re-education, anything that you can uh, relate to basically or think of that could increase your skills and opportunities in finding a job once the economy recovers. And that's the kicker in making sure that even if you are paying 350000 in job guarantee, you are making sure that the skills of people in the economy, they are not lost. And you are, in fact, even increasing that skill set. Increasing the skill set of labor in the economy means that the economy as a total becomes more productive. More productive means lower cost of producing. And therefore, you will have in the longer run, even if you are paying 350,000 instead of 300,000 to people, you will have a disinflationary impact on the economy as a whole. Amazing. Win-win situation. Yeah, it's a real no-brainer. Just briefly, in the paper, you list examples of the kinds of job guarantee jobs you have in mind um, on top of the re-education thing. Could you talk about those? Yes. So one of the biggest problems in Iceland right now is that we need to catch up with the Kyoto Agreement, which basically says, you know, long story short, we are behind when it comes to environmental protection. So within a job guarantee, we can definitely make sure that we will have some projects following, for example, building up forests, reclaiming wetland, maintaining fences and, and you know livestock fences around forests, etc. So that would be one. Maintenance cleanup jobs would be included there as well. You have plenty of public spaces in Iceland which need some sort of a maintenance playgrounds, smaller schools, fences, whatever not, that could be listed there as well. Entrepreneurship can be offered within this as well. Uh, so literally, you can just walk in there, you say, I have this idea right here, You know, please pay me a job guarantee so that I can test out my new idea of a company that I want to uh, set up because I think I can totally make some new product which we can export or whatever not. And maybe every six months or every three months or whatever, you need to make sure that you are you know, sending in some, some basic files to the government to make sure that you are not cheating on this. Essentially, you just need to have some sort of a minimum surveillance system on this one. And then in the end, I mean, plenty of companies like you know, new sort of entrepreneurship programs like this, they will fail. But in many of them, they will have, you, know, you will have some companies that will come out, which will be hugely successful. And they will improve the flora of exports for Iceland. And they will, in the end, make sure that the economy becomes more resilient to shocks. So even if you have 80% of people that would walk into an entrepreneurship program within a job guarantee uh, system, if you have you know, 10% of them setting up a company which you know, goes okay, and then you know, 5% of them they have a you know stratospheric growth which becomes the next Twitter or whatever not mention it. It is literally just enough to make sure that you will have some sort of success out of it. And I would like to highlight here in particular, recently there was an Icelandic company which was bought by Twitter and it was established and set up by a person which grew up on using the social welfare system of Iceland. The social welfare system of Iceland allowed this person to educate himself. He had the opportunity to set up the company, and the company was hugely successful. And this is the movement and the possibilities that we need to allow people to grab on if they want to within some sort of a job guarantee scheme. So that could be another 
easily sort of executionable program within a job currently, an entrepreneurship program. Yeah, I, I think that's the marriage between the basic income idea and the job guarantee that we've been looking for, really, because, you know, UBI people are like, well, give me money. I will definitely be really creative because you've given me free money. <laughs> and people kind of go, well, you are, I know that Randall Ray goes, no, you actually, you know, the, the studies show that actually if you give free money to the Americans, they tend to watch TV. Um, <laughs> my problem with that has been, well, what you're saying is with UBI, you're saying, give me free money, no strings attached. That, you know, that's all right. The government give free money to people all the time for really bad reasons. <laughs> we can talk about government bonds, <laughs> you know, but um, when you give free money to everyone, obviously there's a problem with that <laughs> for starters. But this is basically saying, give me money and I will come to an agreement with you about it. Okay, for the money, I'm going to create this thing. And I, and I think that is, yeah, I, I think that's a great idea. Yes. When I was explaining this idea to somebody back in Iceland, we were having a conversation about why job guarantee instead of a basic income. I agree with the fact that you know basic income would probably have a huge impact on the demand in the economy and you know have a positive impact on the employment. But at the same time, it would probably be very inflationary. And I explained this. So think about you have you have some sort of a so it, it might not be politically correct to use this sort of, you know, comparison. But if you want to kill somebody, don't use an atomic bomb. Use a rifle. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to eliminate unemployment, don't use basic income. Use job guarantee because it's targeted. It focuses directly onto the problem without creating any mess. Hmm. That's a nice analogy. <laughs> well, obviously, without the, the morbid connotations, <laughs> I, I, see, I see why you've chosen it. But also, you know, you do have a response for the person that goes, actually, I would be really creative if people gave me money. We go, okay, then, well, tell us what you're going to do and you get your money. Yes, exactly. And, you know, likewise, the good thing about here is that, you know, those companies that would come out even during the time that they are within the job guarantee program, you essentially are sourcing job opportunities for other people that would be entering the job guarantee program. So imagine if I am, for example, unemployed and I go over to the unemployment office and I say, hey, listen, I would like to be in the job guarantee program and I have this idea. I'm going to sell waffles to Belgium. <laughs> uh, they're going to be amazing. They're going to be much better than the Belgian ones. And, you know, okay, you know, I will, I will manage to somehow convince the person that this is an executionable a business idea. And the person behind the desk asks me, okay, we will pay you uh, job guarantee wages to try to set up this company. Do you need staff? And in that case, I can say, yes, please. I need somebody to download data from me from the internet, somebody, or, you know, I need a, I need a driver or whatever not. And the unemployed driver, he can come to me and say, hey, I'll work for you within this company. And I will also get job guarantee wages from the government. And we try to make this company work. So it's a snowball effect. It's great. There is another aspect of it that I like very much and um, reading articles about deprived areas, uh, you hear a lot that the people within the communities themselves, examples of either groups of women or groups of men who get together and see that, for example, the youth is getting involved in crime, mostly out of boredom or out of one of the consequences of unemployment, and they want to help out by creating youth clubs or social initiatives. And usually these ideas die because of lack of funding. I very much love the proposition that you could just, you know, get together with some people, say, we know what to do because this is our community and we understand it better than anybody. And we're going to go with a proposition to improve the quality of life here and that to be part of the job guarantee. Yes, absolutely. So Iceland, as you can imagine, it's, I mean, it's a tiny community. I mean, we are, we are 360,000. And usually if, if something happens to you, everybody knows it. Let's put it that way. <laughs> And the good thing that has come out of this, you know, close community, I mean, you know, we're like brothers and sisters. We, we fight all the time, but when somebody needs help, we help each other out. Uh, that's a bit like the communal spirit of it. And what has been developed over the time, you know, it goes back to the 1990s, there was a high drinking problem amongst teenagers. And 
the government or essentially uh, the municipalities in the end they were responsible for executing it but they got uh, funding from the amongst other parties the government the municipalities they set up huge programs which made sure that there were some laser activities available after school you know you could go to to the sports center and you could play football you could practice handball and whatever other sports that you wanted to and just by having the activity right there was hugely influential in decreasing teenage alcohol consumption. And this is still going on today. And one of the, the good things within a job guarantee program is that you can easily allow people to step into an existing social structures like this one with just a tiny bit of the extra marginal funding that you need in order to make sure that the wages of the new job guarantee provided employee are financed directly. And you can strengthen the laser activities, especially in case that they are needed in the, in the local community. And like you said, the local community knows best what is needed. In the paper, you do a brief list of the positive impacts of a job guarantee, some of the social implications. Could you talk about some of those? Yeah. I mean, the problem right now, of course, is that you have, I mean, we, we all know the the unemployment, it, it has the not only the financial impact, the negative impact on it, but it's like uh, Patricia was saying, many people, they literally just lose a bit the will. Once you have a job guarantee program and, and people have you know some structure in their day, especially if they go out and they socialize with other people, you immediately improve their social and psychological health. So that's obviously one of the good impacts on it. So it's not only the financial impact that is being sort of cleared or, or improved here. We are trying to make sure that the negative social consequences of unemployment, they are, they are met as well. And it's, it's actually quite easy as well to see that in many cases, you will see that once people, they start socializing more, they become automatically more integrated into society. And one of the problems that we have seen is that because of the language barrier, we don't have as good of a, uh, like a, a mix, so to speak, of you know, people that want to live in Iceland, but they don't uh, speak the language well enough. Within a job guarantee program, they can, for example, think about it, learn Icelandic four hours a day before noon, and then they work in the local community center for four hours in the afternoon. They get exposure to Icelandic. They get exposure to the Icelandic local community, and they get more integrated into the community thanks to job guarantee. And by doing that, you minimize the, the negative impact of unemployment on especially people that don't have a social safety net around them and foreigners simply because they are not. They are implants, so to speak. And they need to be integrated better into society in order to make sure that they feel good in the community that they have joined and a job guarantee program like this would help and just before we move on uh, you mentioned it a few beats ago at the fourth industrialization could you just say what that is yeah so essentially what's going on and you can see it not only in iceland but in internationally as well you can see that many of the tasks that need to be done which are done by humans today they can be easily and often more efficiently done by a robot or a computer. So the fourth industrialization essentially is a bit of the, the mass impact that automatization and, and robotics will have on the demand for labor going forward and what needs to happen. And for example, what I'm doing right now is that I'm trying to up my skills. I'm, I, I'm learning Python right now in order to for me to be able to use the tools of the fourth industrialization when they hit my industry. I'm definitely certain that this is coming. In order for me to keep up with the people that I'm working with and with people that are entering the labor market right now, which have more up-to-date skills than I have, I need to upgrade my skills to be more efficient and simply just keep my job and, and be able to go into other jobs. And that's what a job guarantee can do as well. It can make sure that the rate of renewal of skills in the labor pool uh, is high enough to make sure that we have the right skills in the labor market 
and the right people that know the right skills in order to produce and work with the computers and the robots in the future. It's not going to be an entire replacement of jobs because you know new jobs will be created as you have you know more robots and more computers as that are going forward doing what we humans do today. But we will have different jobs and those different jobs, they require different skills. And we need to make sure that the labor today upgrades the, their skills uh, in order to be able to work with the robots and the computers in the future. Great, great. Let's put it this way. I definitely feel a bit old when I am interviewing <laughs> students and I can see that they know Python and I don't. No, because I'm learning Python too. And I can see everybody learning Python. I think everybody's going into a bit of a panic. <laughs> yes. And I totally should have done this 10 years ago. <laughs> I'm just glad you've said that, you know, that it's not that the jobs are going to disappear. It's just that the jobs are going to be different. And we need to make sure that everybody is ready for that. Yes, exactly. The, the sort of the challenge right now is not the fact that we have the fourth industrialization. It will happen one way or the other. The challenge is that its pace is much quicker now than before. So in the industrialization you know, phases before, it was happening over such a long time that the education system was capable of supplying new skills into the labor force so that the labor force was you know, up to date enough, so to speak, because it was happening over many years. But now the rate of change is so quick, we need to step up the rate of renewal of skills amongst people so that they can work within the new economy which is coming. I see toddlers now in you know museums or in public places and, and they're handling a, an iPad like better than I am. Certainly the world is changing pretty fast for sure. I'm very happy. I am old enough to remember the times before the internet. But I'm probably the last sort of generation that will remember those times. Those were the good days, yeah. That's what a good day is, right? <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Where you had to hand in your homework in a piece of paper. <laughs> and you needed to turn the rotor on, on the phone whenever you wanted to make a phone call. <laughs> yeah. Also, you know, you used to have to have conversations instead of podcasts. Yeah. That too. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Even that. You needed to actually pick up the phone. You couldn't just text. <laughs> The other thing I, um, I was reading about was that in, in, I believe, the first industrial revolution, it was quite common for workers to actually uh, vandalize the machines because they were afraid that they were going to take off their jobs. In a way, we're, we're going through the same thing, but I guess in a slightly different way, people are just really afraid of the way technology is advancing. Sure. And you can say the same thing about economics professors right now. I mean, they look at MMT and they think to themselves, oh my God, I need to change my, my presentation skills and my slides. Well, they should be afraid. <laughs> but, uh, but are they not going to do it? So they try to slow down the, the inevitable, but in the end, they become dinosaurs because they still try to hang on to the old, which is not really relevant anymore. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, they, they are doing a good job. <laughs> of hanging in there aren't they you know you've got yes they are sure <laughs> but i think actually i mean it's clear exactly but the problem is that it's so ingrained in the population to think of money as things yeah and that's why it's so easy to you know picture the process of you know you need to take your money the stuff that you hold you need to put it in the bank so that the bank can then lend this money out to somebody else. I mean, exactly because we haven't learned yet to think of money as credit and something that you actually don't touch. That's why it's so difficult to break free of the, the old mantra of, of you know, the, the commodity theory of money. Yeah, it's like it, the wind is at their back. Sure, exactly. Once you grasp it, once you start thinking of, you know, once you just get into the habit of thinking of money as credit, something that you do not touch, you, you know, credit is just there. It's not the money that you hold. Once you get into this habit, it's amazing to see how easy it is to realize how MMT works or basically not how MMT works, just how the financial system works, which is the way that MMT is describing it. So the last sentence in your policy note, your job guarantee proposal is, what are we waiting for? 
what would you say is holding it back? I think it's still the, you know, the fear of realizing that something that you thought was true actually wasn't true because implementing a job guarantee programming, it's solid. I mean, it's, it's easy to realize it once you see how the, how the financial system works and how a such a program can have a stabilizing impact on the economy, both for employment and for prices. But it's just a mentally difficult task to realize, first of all, that MMT is correct when it's describing the financial system. And then it's another difficult task to realize that, okay, you know, not only is the description correct of the financial system that is within MMT, but this the or, or practically the only policy recommendation within MMT is a job guarantee. And it's a, almost a two-step process. Not only do you need to accept that MMT makes sense and it's how the financial system works, but you also need to agree to the policy recommendation within MMT. And that's a bit of a, a mental sort of difficult task that takes a bit of a, an effort to realize, especially if you have always been thinking about the way the economy works as per the commodity theory of money has been describing it. I was just going to ask, how integrated into the EU is Iceland? Do they limit what the government can do? So it's the same essentially as Liechtenstein and, and Norway. So Iceland is a part of the European economic area, which basically means that we, for example, we need to adopt some of the laws which are set by the European Union, for example, consumer protection laws and environmental laws. In many cases, they come from the European Union, financial regulation, for example, as well. But when it comes to the currency, obviously, we have our own currency. It's free floating and we are not part of the EMU or to be part of the Eurozone or anything like that. And likewise, the European Union has nothing to say to the Icelandic government with regards to whether they want to have a 3% deficit or 10% deficit. They can basically control the, the fiscal policy as however they want. So the Maastricht Treaty with regards to the 3% deficit maximum and the 60% floor uh, ceiling, which you know, of course, today it's not actually being, it's not in, eff in effect and hopefully will be cancelled. But uh, that has never applied in Iceland. It has, however, been adopted, but that was a unilateral decision. And so the government of Iceland actually adopted a very similar Maastricht Treaty rule with regards to fiscal policy. And again, it was based on the idea that the government needs to tax in order to find the funds to you know, finance expenditures, etc. When in reality, of course, what happens is that whenever the Icelandic government pays for something in the Icelandic economy, the money supply is going up. And likewise, the money supply goes down whenever they are paying taxes to the government. Was that justified on the basis of the European Maastricht Treaty? Or was that completely separate? So it was basically just referenced to the Maastricht Treaty. The idea was to set up a similar sort of a sound finance rules as within the, the Maastricht Treaty. Sort of, if they're doing that, then it must be the right thing to do. Yes, exactly. It was inspired, so we put it. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> no, Iceland. Just uh, there's quite a few countries out there that really wish they could back out of it. <laughs> yes, indeed. Absolutely. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. So we mentioned when we spoke the other day briefly that there is talk of Iceland starting a sovereign wealth fund. Could you talk about the usefulness of sovereign wealth funds in general when viewed through the MMT lens? So via the MMT lens, essentially you don't need one, but it might be sensible to have one if your uh, monetary sovereignty is very low. So essentially you just need to think about this from a system dynamics point of view. You need to make sure that the resilience in the system is strong enough to absorb and meet any shocks that may happen to the system or within the system. And so a sovereign wealth fund is it's a part of perhaps some sort of a you know insurance policy that you can think of it. But it's not necessary, essentially. But it still, of course, has some sort of a system impact. How far down the road towards having one is Iceland? Quite far, I think. 
I mean, right now, what we have is we have quite a bit more of foreign exchange reserves right now. But those reserves, they are all in the classical, I mean, they're all stored in the classical way of just having, you know, short-term bonds and treasury notes, etc. So it's very, very liquid. And the idea with a sovereign wealth fund is a bit more of, you know, allowing yourself to put at least some of the money into a bit more riskier investments and long-term investments, real estate even, or equities and so on. But right now, there has been some talk about it. Exactly, they want to, for example, use the money which is uh, generated by the National Power Company, which sells energy to the aluminium smelters and receives dollar payments. They want to perhaps use that as one of the sources of flows, basically, into the sovereign wealth fund. But right now, this is you know still in the beginning states, and quite frankly, may never happen. How do you feel about it, knowing what you know and about MMT and everything? Do you think it's it's probably a good idea? I mean, right now, so a few years ago, I probably would have said, yes, we should definitely have a, a sovereign wealth fund. Um, the biggest impact on on having one right now would be having, you know, essentially um, some sort of a long term investment somewhere. But that's you know, why not allowing people to do that themselves? You don't need the government to do it. Mm. And the mm. government certainly doesn't need the money to to finance its its domestic expenditures. So if you're going to build up a sovereign wealth fund, just let the private sector do it. You know, let people save in US dollars if they want to do it. Not a problem. Um, obviously, we need to have... Um, we need to have a uh, positive current account over the long run in order to finance the buildup of such a such a uh, such a fund. And likewise, at the same time, the central bank is responsible for the uh, foreign reserves, which on their own are quite a uh, an important shock absorber and um, sort of resilient uh, factor or resilient note in the in the system. So. Right now, I don't think the government needs to think about a sovereign wealth fund. Um, Patricia, I was going to just sort of wrap up in, in a minute. Do you have anything to, you want to ask? Uh, only if the volcano is something that we should be worried about right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. Um, there was a... Uh, we, were, we were actually... I need to actually make sure that um, I remember... Um, the name of the volcano, because the biggest joke right now is, <laughs> you know, if we do have a uh, an eruption, will it be another one where the name of the volcano is completely incomprehensible to anyone except myself? <laughs> we'll just make up a name. For we, it. you, you probably can. Uh, you probably can. Uh, but long story short, no, you don't need to worry about it. Um, right, right, right now, it's it's very active, definitely. And people back in, in Reykjavik area, actually, they are getting a bit tired uh, of the of the earthquakes. Um, but it's it's entirely different sort of geological system in comparison to the uh, Eyjafjallajökull uh, eruption back in 2010. So even if we would have the aviation industry back flying around the world, we probably would not uh, ground it again like we did 11 years ago. So Olaf, what are you involved in right now? You've got a Patreon where people can follow and support your work, and uh, you're adding to that all the time. You're prolific. Um, we'll link to that. But do you have anything else you'd like people to have a look at or support? Um, well, right now, because you mentioned Patreon, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to put more uh, material in there in English. Uh, so far, I've been writing it in, in Icelandic, uh, focusing in, in, you know, mainly on the Icelandic population, obviously. But uh, no, check out, you can, you can check out my, uh, my Patreon, uh, definitely. And um, hopefully uh, going down the road, I'll manage to actually publish the book that I am writing in Icelandic, though, on how MMT in Iceland works. And then, I al- and then I've already actually thought of another book that I want to write in English um, about how the Icelandic story can teach people a bit more in especially small economies about how MMT works and how uh, we need to sort of, you know, focus on some particular um, economic factors to understand and, and make sure that um, good knowledge of MMT will be beneficial in other economies as well. 
which do not have the same size as perhaps larger economies like the US or the UK and Japan. Oh, that sounds great. We, we, we very much look forward yeah. to uh, when that becomes a thing and we can plug it and read it. Um, but anyway, Olaf, thank you so much for your time. It's been great. It's been a, a, a learning experience for us, an education for us. Um, and uh, we will link to everything you're doing. Uh, thanks for your time, Olaf. Yes, thank you. It's amazing to meet you. Thanks. Well, thank you, Patricia. And uh, thank you, Christian. It was, uh, it was a pleasure to be with you. That was the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Don't forget, you can support the show through Patreon, starting at a dollar a month and get access to patron-only episodes. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. You can also find me on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can find Patricia on Twitter at Patricia N. Pino. And you can email us at mmtpodcast at outlook.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope to hear from you.